Hey, this is J.D. Webb. I uh, want to apologize for uh, what you're about to hear. My mouse died uh, right at the beginning of the show. We managed to get the uh, show off the ground, the intro and everything was live. But uh, when I went to start the encoder, my mouse was dead, and I was frantically trying to change batteries uh, and get the uh, darn thing working again. So uh, we're lucky that uh, we were able to get what we did get. Chris was just introduced. He's talking about the heart murmur. Uh, it's a knockoff on Ken Schramm's Heart of Darkness, Melomel. So uh, please enjoy the show, and hey, I promise we will do better next time. Honey would would go well with those fruit flavors. Um, and through the course of experimenting with this thing, I found out that there were some techniques that needed to be done that were a little bit out of the ordinary and not things that, that you might consider basic need-making skills. But then again, it's not really that difficult either. You just got to know when to do them and, and how to manage the fermentation. So... Um, what I'm doing, uh, I've got the final iteration of this thing now is in uh, an aging vessel. It'll be there for a few months. I'm going to taste it. I'm going to make sure that everything is where I want it to be. And then we'll be posting up the, the recipe and along with complete detailed instructions on how you can make it yourself. And uh, we'll I'll see if I can get JD to post that on the uh, on the meat house, and I'll post it on all the other forums that I come across, and anywhere that we can find a place to put it to get it out there. And if you follow the instructions, hopefully it'll turn out good for you. And you may learn some new um, need making techniques in the process, and learn some things that yeast can do that maybe you thought they couldn't do. Yeah. Very yeah. interesting. Well, I don't want to jump so, the gun on that, but Chris, I'm I'm just so interested to learn more about the process that you followed. You know, do you ferment the the fruit in the primary, or is it, it added during the secondary fermentation? And so many questions to to ask about that. Well, all of my fruit goes in primary. Um, uh, some spices and things may go in secondary. Uh, on methaglins, I typically put all my fruit up front in primary. Uh, and there, that's another thing that I want to discuss in some upcoming shows, some ways to, you know, I hear people say, um, I want to put fruit in secondary because I want more fruit character. Well, uh, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, you can put fruit in primary and get tons of fruit character. But there are some fermentation techniques that you can do to enhance that. Uh, and also something as simple as just how much fruit you put in. Uh, you can't put two pounds of fruit per gallon in primary and get tons of fruit character most of the time. Uh, you got to load the thing up with fruit and you got to follow the right procedures. Uh, in some upcoming episodes, I would like to discuss some of these things, and, and, and one of the subjects that is going to be really important is going to be um, the oxidative and reductive ferments, and uh, I'd like to talk about that in, a, in an upcoming episode, and we'll compare the two, uh, when should you use them, when should you avoid them, how do you use them, um, and a little bit about what they do. And I'll even try to give you a recipe and a little experiment that you can do maybe with a side-by-side one-gallon batches, and you can taste the difference for yourself. Yeah, that sounds good. I, um, I, you know, I skipped right over part of our, part of our opening of course. This is about how relaxed this show is. We have a call-in number. Uh, if you want to call the show, the number is 818-921-4680. Let's do that again, J.D. 818 You know, and I've done this so damn many times in the past. <laughs> it, this should be an old hat. Uh, but uh, the number, 818-921-4680, the Mead House uh, radio show. Feel free to give us a holler. Uh, if we're talking about something that uh, piques your interest, give, a, give us a call, and uh, we'll be glad to uh, 
uh, have you join in on the conversation with us. But, uh, yeah, you know, Chris is talking about something that, that um, I learned uh, here a while back about this, you know, putting fruit in, uh, you know, doing a mellow mel. And uh, I've heard it be told by uh, uh, quite a few people that more is better. Uh, and that, you know, you, you read recipes online and so many of them say, you know, anywhere from two and a half to three pounds per gallon is what you should use. Yet, uh, you know, you, you talk to people like uh, Pete Bakulich and he says, you know, the more is better. So if you can go four or five pounds per gallon, uh, you know, that's much better. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll give you a little hint. Uh, give you a little hint. The uh, the heart murmur has got seven pounds per gallon of fruit. Seven pounds. So, per gallon. yeah, yeah. And then yeah, the other thing, uh, the other thing that you have to be uh, concerned about with the fruit is displacement and uh, maybe later on down the line uh, you know when we get things rolling on the show here I'll talk more about the the, the failed pumpkin experiment I don't want to go into all the details right now but Chris knows exactly what I'm talking about he was oh, yeah. uh, he was with me from the start of it but you know from the very beginning I mean I'm thinking 27 pounds of, of roasted you know pumpkin and that's a lot of pumpkin. Okay, I don't care what anybody says. That, that's a that's a lot of pumpkin. Well, oh, yeah. well, I have a seven I have a seven gallon stainless steel fermenter that I use. So when I went to put that twenty seven pounds in, I had to take out about almost two gallons of must uh, in order to fill you know to to drop that uh, that uh, pumpkin in because of displacement. So if you're thinking, you know, like Chris, he's doing seven pounds a gallon uh, fruit uh, up front to primary, keep that in the back of your mind that that fruit is going to have to replace, uh, you know, the, the liquid in your container. So make sure you've got a big enough container that's going to handle Well, I'll give you, I'll give you another little uh, teaser on this thing. Uh, the fruit does never go into the primary fermentation bucket. Um when I first started this experiment, I was juicing all this fruit. And uh, if you've never tried to juice 18 pounds of raspberries, you need to try it one time. Uh, my, my kitchen looked like somebody had been brutally murdered in there by the time oh I got the juice. I can just and, uh, Oh, my God. So I found a way to do it. That, that I did on this last batch, it worked really well. I got just about all the juice you could get out, so I never put any pulp or seeds or anything in the primary. It was all juice. So I will admit there are easier ways to do it, and I will give you that option in the recipe when I, when I get it put out there. But... Uh, I like doing it this way, and it's it's not all that difficult. It just takes a little extra time to do. I found a, a, a great, great product that I'll be introducing you to as well. Yeah. Interesting. Well, looking forward to hearing about that. And I'll, I'll tell you, I have just done a, a handful of melomels myself, and only one of those melomels did I use fresh fruit. Um, the others I've used, what is it, the, the Vintner's Harvest, the canned fruit purees. I've done some, some peach batches and, and a cherry one, but the one time I used fresh fruit it was with some some local raspberries that my wife and I went and picked at, at a local farm here, you know, up up north of uh, Milwaukee, and just I, I ran into some issues as well. Now I added those fruits to the secondary fermenter, and you know we had frozen them, you know, a day or two in advance to help kind of break down those cell walls and, and help the juice extraction during the the secondary fermentation, uh, but. 
all of my fermentation vessels are glass carboys with those, you know, small necks up, up right. at the top and, and trying to <laughs> force. I think we probably used about nine pounds of, of raspberries and trying to force those through that tiny little hole up at the top was mm-hmm. not the most fun experience. And then trying to get them yeah. back out afterwards, that, that wasn't too it's fun either. Good, that's a good reason to use buckets to ferment. In, and it's a good reason to put them in primary. <laughs> yep, yep. Gonna have to my, invest in a nice bucket one of these days. My first, uh, my first experience with making mead in, in large quantities, you know, was a five-gallon batch of a takeoff of Joe's Ancient Orange. But uh, I didn't use the Fleischmann yeast. I used D forty-seven, and I cut the, I, I cut the oranges up. And, you know, like you're saying, forced them through the neck of the... And that's the last time I ever fermented in a glass jug. So, I mean, you know, when it was all done, trying to pull those those cut-up oranges out of the damn carboy, I, I was ready to take the carboy downstairs and just put it in the dumpster and start over. So. I believe- well, you know, this brings up... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I was just saying, I believe that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, my first two batches were in carboys, and I haven't fermented in a carboy since that time. Um, but I'm glad you brought this up because uh, I was mentioning uh, oxidative and reductive ferments that I'm going to talk about in another episode. Um that's another good reason to use a bucket because you've got full control over that. Uh, and you'll understand more about it when we get there. I'm purposefully teasing you to, to get you to listen again. So You are, uh, Chris. I'll tell you, I, these are new terms for me, oxidative and reductive ferments. Uh, so you're telling me I have to wait for another show after this? <laughs> yeah, everybody's got to come back. Yep. <laughs> He's pretty good at this. Yeah. yeah. I'll say. Well, I just, you know, um, that first, the first batch, I'm finally drinking the stuff. Uh, of course, I, you know, at the time, I didn't know anything about temperature control. I mean, all the recipes that you read on, you know, all these websites, the homesteaders and preppers, and they put up all these great recipes, you know. But what they don't tell you, they don't tell you anything about nutrients. They don't tell you anything about, you know, temperature controls and, and that kind of thing. So that first batch, uh, when it all cleared, you know, we took a sip. And, I mean, I probably could have sold it as lighter fluid to all my neighbors. Uh, it was that toxic. But I thought, you know what, uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and bottle this stuff up. Well, that was over a year ago. Uh, in fact, it was a, it, it's over a year old. It's a year and, I don't know, four or five months old now. And now it's starting to come around. It's finally starting to taste like a like a I don't know, like a Chardonnay type wine. You know, it's not there's no sweetness to it. Just very 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 slight on the tongue when you first put it in your mouth. But uh, I, I'm kind of liking it. You know, uh, but of course I mean it had the citrus here. So oh, absolutely. Hey. I'm sorry, Chris. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say that works sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't. Well, you know, I mean, I I guess, I mean, if I were to go back and and count up the gallons of honey that I've poured down the garbage disposal of all the failed uh, attempts at making mead, uh, you know, I'm I'm sure I could probably stock a small store, but... uh, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, how many times you got to do this before you get it right and, you know, finally get on to some good information that uh, kind of... And that's why people need to listen to the show, because we yeah. we pour honey down the drain so you don't have to. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> hey, that sounds like a slogan. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, write that down, will you? <laughs> <laughs> Let's remember <Yeah>. that. <laughs> we pour honey down the drain so you don't have to. Oh, um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think we've all been there, done that. Uh, I want to introduce Jeff Schrauss. Uh, Jeff uh, joining us here tonight on the show. He um, he posted up uh, this deal. And before we talk about that, Jeff, um, he, he posted up this uh, experiment that he's doing with nutrients and whatnot. And 
uh, I found it quite uh, uh, quite interesting. So uh, we're going to let Jeff talk about that for a minute. But Jeff, go back to the first, uh, you know, your first batches. Uh, how, how many of them went down the garbage disposal? Well, you know, I, not a lot of them have gone down the garbage disposal, but that may just be that I have a, a tolerance for some not so great meat too. <laughs> <laughs> totally uh, agree. I, a lot of a lot of my uh, my experiments here have been like with little one gallon batches that aren't terribly uh, oh terribly heartbreaking to lose either. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I've tried some that just did not pan out. We had a uh, we we actually tried a saffron at one time that I thought would be amazing if I could get that delicate saffrony flavor with a kind of a, a semi dry mead and oh, wow. it did not succeed at all. It was just no, ridiculously uh, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, and I think that's the uh, I think that's the unique thing about making mead is you know it's it's honey and water and yeast and whatever in the hell else you can think of to. Uh, throw in there to come up with an interesting, you know, tasty flavor. And I think that's the cool thing about mm-hmm. about fermenting mead. Uh, oh, I absolutely agree with you there. You know, I'm a, mm-hmm. it, it, it's almost like the beer. Now, I, I, I love my craft beer. I love my craft beer. I will never drink another Miller, Coors, Sab, you know what I mean? Uh, my, Paps. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Budweiser. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know about Paps. I might drink another Paps. Uh, but, you know, it, it was a profound experience when I had my first craft beer to the point where I thought, damn, I'm drinking beer for the first time. And I was, you know, I'm like 40 years old. Uh, well, more than that, 50 years old. And it, it was a very profound experience. And, and then now when I go to the shelf, I'm looking at stuff that's like uh, – you know, peanut butter milk stout, uh, marshmallow orange lime, you know, <laughs> you know, and meat is kind of the same way. I mean, and, and that's what the, what's cool about it. You can, you, you can experiment until your heart's content to come up with something that, you know, actually tastes pretty good. And when you find the right recipe that you love, uh, you can always rest assured that you'll always have a surprise every time you make it because you cannot duplicate it any more than you can duplicate uh, a batch of wine. Uh, every year, the grapes are going to have a different characteristic because of the amount of rainfall, uh, when they were harvested, the length of the growing season, uh, how much nutrient is in the soil. And if you think that wine has uh, a variation, uh, think about mead for a moment. Uh, yeah. Not only is honey different from one blossom to the next, or from, but it's also different from one area of the country to the next, and it's even different from season to season. And uh, you, you've got a beehive out here, and you go take the honey, and you go back in four, five, six months and take the honey again from that same hive is going to be different. Yeah. Uh, it's never the same. You're never Absolutely. going to make the same mead twice. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, orange blossom honey from out here in California certainly tastes different than the orange blossom honey in Florida. And then the orange mm-hmm. blossom honey from year to year out here tastes different. Uh, right. You know, and, of course, California being, you know, we, we've just gone through a drought uh, you know, a drought out here that that has left a lot of a lot of our agriculture just you know high and dry. So, uh, you know, I'm wondering how that's going to affect the uh, uh, you know the honey production, uh, you know, in the future here too. So, mm-hmm. yeah, and uh, you know, it's just it's so amazing the but the differences in in all these honeys. That's the that's one reason why. Everyone needs to learn how to how to um, taste the honey, how to smell the honey, and through the experience, you will you will eventually get to a point where you know what that honey is going to do in a mead. Now, I will admit, I'm not there yet. 
uh, I'm better than I used to be, but um, everyone's going to have something that they're very sensitive to, and they're going to have something that they're not good at detecting. Uh, for me, uh, I happen to be very sensitive to anything that's herbaceous or green, grass-tasting type flavors. Uh, if it has bitterness, if it has a sourness to it, I'm very sensitive to those things. So that, I guess that's a good thing for me when I'm choosing honey because you don't want that in a honey most of the time for mead. Uh, so um, a good honey that's good for the table to put on biscuits, to put on uh, your waffles or whatever, may not necessarily be good for mead. Yeah. Yeah, and and what I have found that happens, uh, anything that's in that honey is going to get concentrated when you ferment it. So if it has a slight bitterness to it, uh, once when, when once it's fermented, it's going to have a lot of bitterness to it. Uh, it just concentrates it and brings it out. It's funny, so, it's yeah. funny how that works. You know, you take your first taste of it, and it's like, wow, this tastes really amazing. But then when you ferment it all out and everything, it's like, whoa, where'd that come from? <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's difficult to learn to train your palate to, to look past the sweetness because that's the primary thing in honey. And then when you ferment it, that's gone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and exactly. so you're, you know, and that's difficult to do. And I'm, I'm by no means good at it yet. Uh, well, better than I was. You know, I know some some people who may be listening to the show who heard me on the other show talking about that wildflower honey. Yeah, I'm going to mention it again. Now, I sent a gallon of that wildflower honey down to Mississippi, down to Chris. Now, Chris. You you smelled and you taste. Did that stuff taste like it smelled? I mean, did you get not that necessarily? No. no, no, not really. Um, what I got a very uh, in the aroma of that honey, it was very malty. Uh, almost had a little bit of sorghum or molasses type aroma. Yeah, but but the flavor was very very floral. Uh, it, it had no herbaceous character. It had no green, grass, sour, bitter, milkweed type flavors. It was all wildflowered. It, it just tasted like flowers. Yeah. And that's, that's a perfect example of what you're looking for in a wildflower honey. And it was one of the sweetest honeys I've ever tasted. I don't know what the sugar level was in that honey, but it had, it was it had to be the sweetest honey I've ever tasted. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Just, I, mean, I just uh, you know I I I don't know how to taste honey yet. Of course, I really haven't sat down and gone through that whole process. Aaron's got this. Uh, he's got an experience. This is probably the appropriate time. Uh, Aaron, you've got this experiment going with uh, different varietals of honey going on. What, talk to us about that. What, what do you got going there? Absolutely. Well, let me just preface it by saying I'm kind of new to, to this whole concept of tasting honey before it goes into the mead and, and seeing how that initial flavor translates to the finished product. So um, with, with this particular experiment, that was definitely one of the things that I wanted to focus on was taking some, some tasting notes of the honey beforehand. And just recently over this past weekend, I, I racked it from, from primary to secondary and took some tasting notes afterwards as well. So this particular experiment, I'm comparing four different honey varietals, a cranberry blossom, a blueberry blossom, raspberry blossom, and then a sunflower blossom as well. 
So, like I say, I'm, I'm kind of new to the, the process and, and this concept of tasting honey. So some of the, the notes I took down are, are probably pretty simple and may not be using just the right terminology just yet. But the cranberry. It's all right. We'll get there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's a learning process, and uh, yeah. you know, just it's I, I'm uh, just excited to be learning here. So, so uh, what what is, yeast did you use for these, Aaron? It's a great question. So initially, I wanted to test out some ale yeasts. So initially, I pitched the US05. Is it the the Cephalo ale yeast? And um, after about forty eight hours, I I might have gotten a little premature here, but after. Well, the first 24 hours, there was absolutely no sign of fermentation. And in my experiences with, with dry ale yeast, um, you know, in beer, usually within 24 hours, it just shoots off like a rocket. So, uh, you know, after that first 24 hours, I was a little bit worried that, that something might not be going quite right. So I pitched another batch of the US05. Um, 24 hours later, still absolutely no, no sign of, of activity at all. Um, so at that point, I, I pitched some D47 in there. Now, the, the starting gravity or the, the bricks on these was 25, which, uh, you know, I'm not quite sure. It might be just a little high for for that ale yeast. But once I pitched the D47, it just took off. I guess I'm going to have to learn bricks after all, too. <laughs> so is that about 11, 11, 18 or so, 11, 20? Somewhere around in there? Yeah, I think it's uh, 1105, 1110, kind of around in that area, I think. Okay, yeah, okay. So, so, the so we're working is, with D47. We're working with D47, yep. Okay. Um, and, and well, after pitching the Cephal 05, right? That's right, and I was going to say, unless somehow that that ale yeast was able to colonize in there, and and maybe it took off, just a you know after no. a couple of days, but I I just uh, suspect it's D forty seven that that actually that D forty seven ate it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cannibalistic damn thing. Guarantee you, the D forty seven took it over completely. <laughs> I would not doubt it. That's that's definitely what I suspect happened. So yeah. it started fermenting. Started fermenting, and even I'll tell you, I'll back up just a second here to to talk about just some of the the tastes of these different hun- honeys. Um, so the cranberry one was was very rich. It was probably the richest of the four. Um, I, I, you know, Chris, I heard you use the word malty over um, uh, another honey. I think it was the the wildflower kind of a sorghum type flavor, and this cranberry mm-hmm. definitely had that pre fermentation. Um, the mm-hmm. blue the blueberry one was a little bit like I, I described it as round and kind of flat, not really much acidity and, and just you know very very kind of neutral. Um, the raspberry one was surprisingly floral with just kind of a nice medium sweetness, and then the sunflower one was really interesting when when I actually picked these honeys up the the lady that, that I was buying it from said that it had almost a metallic flavor um, I didn't really get the metallic flavor from it but it, it was very bright and acidic crisp and, and almost tart uh, kind of a mineral quality I could see that maybe a little bit of a mineral type of quality to it it was also the lightest in color of the bunch too just uh, you know just a bright almost straw gold color to it so so the the meads you know they they went through they fermented and i will also say in the past i have like you like we've kind of been talking about i've made my fair share of rocket fuel that um, I, I've never really been able to achieve just that level of quality that I've really been shooting for. And I did a few things differently throughout the fermentation this time. And I have to say it just really translated very well to the finished product. Um, so before 
uh, you know, before this batch, I, I came across this website, meadmaderight.com. Um, and Jeff, I think this is um, one of the, the nutrients that you are incorporating into your ex- experiment there as well. But the Fermade O and the, the organic nitrogen. So this was my first time using organic nitrogen and, and the Fermade O. It was also my first time following that protocol of degassing the mead two times per day. Um, I also, you know, was was sure to keep the the temperatures in control here. I'll tell you, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in the winter time down here in my basement, it it doesn't really get above sixty five degrees, and and probably averages more, you know, like sixty three most of the time. So, um, pretty pretty optimal temperatures there, and. Um, Trying to think if there was Aaron, if, you, if you hang around us for very long, all these things you've mentioned are going to be what you consider standard practice. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it's uh, just part of the part of the process, exactly, to making quality mm-hmm. mead. So, um, you know, I, I also invested in, in a couple other things. I, I got one of these pH meters, one of these E-Tech City pH meters. Didn't really need it. Um, all of all of the pH levels for these started out above four and just barely dropped under, you know, th- the 3.9 range or so throughout the, the course of fermentation. So never needed to add any buffering like potassium bicarbonate or anything like that. Um, and, and really had a, a pretty clean fermentation up until, you know, this, this past weekend when I racked it. So, um, while, while I was racking it, I took some samples and, and, um, was just extremely pleased with, with what came out. I felt like these meads after about a month of primary fermentation already were cleaner, smoother, and just more palatable in such a short time than several of the other batches that I've done that have been aging for anywhere from one to six years. So I, I'm just real excited about this Tazna re- regimen here. Mm-hmm. Um, so in, in terms of the, the flavors after fermentation, it, it was really interesting. The, the cranberry has a very strong just a honey aroma. And what's interesting is like the upfront taste that you get is very tart and sour, almost like a cranberry. Um, I would say that that initial flavor there for the cranberry blossom most closely resembles the fruit of the blossom of, of all the four batches. But what's interesting then is the aftertaste finishes very malty, Almost the way I would describe it is like a a raw unboiled malt extract for for anyone who's ever you know used malt extract in in home brewing beer. Um, just another interesting thing about that one is just the color. It turned out to be almost like a brilliant shade of red, also very closely resembling the the cranberries as well, like an Irish red ale or something. That's, you know, that's actually a really good comparison for that, like a Killian's or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 That's beautiful. Yeah. I'm assuming you took these dry. D47 would have taken that, should have taken it dry. Yep. It took it down to about, well, the bricks level was 10 for both the cranberry and blueberry and then 9 for the raspberry and sunflower, which translates to about like a 1.001. So really, really pretty dry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. I'm just going to have to do this. Google uh, bricks. J.D., go get your hydrometer. Yep. You got a triple scale hydrometer. It should be on there. <laughs> this is quicker. <laughs> I, I'm, you know what? I mean, everywhere I go now, people talking bricks. You know, I started, I started making wine too, kit wines, and uh, uh-huh. I got a Pinot Noir going. My wife is a, she loves Pinot Noir, so I, I got a batch of Pinot Noir with a bag of blackberries in it for her. So, uh, and everything, you know, I mean, you, and I go to the winemaking talk forum over there, which is probably the premier. Wine home wine making forum, and uh, I mean everybody talks bricks or whatever when it comes to wine. So I just <laughs> I I got to get into that mode. So and what a good oh, I'm, I'm stuck on the specific gravity. Go ahead. 
Oh, just what, what a good husband making that blackberry Pinot Noir. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what uh, what was your, you know, when you're fermenting, um, had you already known about temperature control and that kind of thing? What, what was the area that you were fermenting in? What kind of area? So it's just down in, in my basement here. Uh, my basement is kind of segment, segmented out into like a semi-finished area with carpet and then an unfinished area as well. Um, so the unfinished area is kind of my meat experimentation area where I've got all my equipment. And, and that's also where I do the fermentation where it so you know, stays it's, pretty cool. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's cool. about 63. So um, <laughs> just, you know, one, one other thing, the one that I'm the most excited about is the sunflower blossom. The smell of this, it smells like apple juice and, and it just tastes really? like li- Yeah, it just tastes like liquid sunshine too. Um, kind of that bright tart flavor that you get almost a little sharpness from, from the original honey just carried through, but it picked up even like an apple flavor as well. It's, it's really interesting, almost like a tart apple. Like a Granny Smith almost. So really excited about that batch, too. Yeah, I've got a sourwood honey here uh, that has a lot of apple character to it just in the honey itself. And I'm hoping that comes through in the finished mead. That's uh, that's actually, as soon as we get back from North Carolina, that's going to be the next batch that uh, we put together, Chris, is that uh, sourwood uh, Okay. Yeah, you're gonna like it. You're you're gonna like it. I'll I'll send you my notes on that as well, and we'll we'll post. Uh, you know, I don't want to turn this into a private conversation either because we got listeners out here. All of this stuff that I'm gonna get to JD that I'm mentioning, and we'll post it up so everyone can can see what we're talking about, and you can do it yourself. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, we can throw it up on the uh, the Meat House website, themeathouse dot com. And, yep. uh, you know, keep some notes up there and, you know, people interest. And, and this is what it's all about for us. This, you know, this is, this mm-hmm. is why we're doing the show is to be able to share information, share experiences, talk to people and get, uh, you know, get input from, from other people who have done this mm-hmm. or even people who are, who are wanting to do this, but don't know where to begin. We all had to start somewhere and we're all still. Yeah. Learning. Oh. And I, I want to try to do a recipe of the week if if we can, or maybe it, it may turn into a recipe of the month. I don't know, but uh, I, ha- I was going to have one ready for tonight, but needless to say, I got a little bit sidetracked. No, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, but uh, I'll try to get that worked up. Uh, it's a recipe that I did a long time ago, and it actually came out better than I expected. So next week we'll do the recipe of the week or recipe of the month or something and it's going to be a curry mead. Oh, so wow. Oh, wow. so those, of you, those of you who want to try something a little bit uh, wacko and out there this will be the one for you to try. There you go. Out Sounds game. right up my alley. I, <laughs> I love curry. Yeah, I can curry. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's sort of a sort of a Thai curry mead, and uh, it'll surprise you know it's it's not too bad. It's not the best mead I ever made, but it's uh, and, you know sometimes you you, you make melomels, you make traditionals, you make sizers, and then you make them over again, and and sometimes you just want to do something that's just different than everything else, and. Uh, okay. So this will be one of those meads that, you know, I, I'd suggest a one-gallon batch. But uh, yeah, it, it will sneak you know, up on you. <laughs> you know, maybe we can even, uh, you know, might even be able to get together on some of these, uh, you know, like do a recipe of the month. And, you know, if we can all get the, you know, if it's uh, clover honey or wildflower honey, we could all get together and do a batch. And uh, compare notes, uh, you know, during the show as we go, and uh, uh, you know whatever the outcome is going to be, uh, be interesting to talk about the different flavors uh, that each one of us might come up with. So that's something that we may, uh, uh, you know, have a sideline on or a sidebar and see if we can't get it worked out. But, uh, That'd be interesting. I'll try to get healed up. 
Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that would definitely be interesting to to go back to the earlier point about just the variation in honey and, and ingredients from region to region across the country. You know, to to see the the ingredients that you're getting in Mississippi and uh, out in California, and, and then up here up north, just the the variation in, in flavors that we get that way. Chris doesn't have much of a selection of honey down where he's at. Uh in Mississippi, Jeff, what what are some of the varietals uh, that you have around your area there in Kansas City? Well, really, what I'm finding a lot more of than anything is uh, is wildflower and um, basic clover alfalfa honeys. Um, not really finding a lot from from local beekeepers that I've talked to that have uh, specific things like oh, blueberry or fruit or something like that. Do you live near an agricultural area, or? Um, I'm in the city, but the, the uh, there's you know farmland all around the city. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, and Jeff, uh, don't discount a good clover honey. If you can, if you can get your hands on a uh, on a true white clover honey, you will be amazed at what it can do. Uh, big, big difference from what you're going to go buy in the box stores. Uh, uh, find some real true clover, white clover honey. You'll be, you'll be amazed at what you can do with it. Yeah, we'll look around for some, yeah. Yeah, see if you can find some white clover. Good stuff. Well, now, Chris, is, is that the one that I've heard described as almost like a peppery type of a flavor? It can have it can have a peppery uh, note. It can even have uh, sort of a peppermint, uh, mini type, minty type note. Um, yeah, it it can be quite zesty at times. Uh, it really comes through in certain mellow males really well. It works good, and it, and it makes a good traditional as well. So, um, you know, I, I, I've heard it said before that, you know, well, clover honey is a waste of time. Well, yeah, maybe most of the time it is, but it's because you haven't gotten any true good clover honey. Yeah. And I think, to, in, I don't know, to my palate, I think white clover really stands above, above the others. Well, you know, I, I've gotten two. Uh, I've gotten two buckets of that wildflower honey. Well, it's, and obviously, it's not the same. This bucket of wildflower honey isn't doesn't anywhere come close to the same taste as the first bucket of of wildflower that I got from my beekeeper. And uh, that being said. Both of them taste much different than the wildflower honey that you get out of the store. So, you know, store-bought honey, box stores, like Chris calls them, uh, you know, I, I think for the most part their honey is put through all kinds of pasteurization, heating, and, you know, uh, things are done to it to take, you know, some of the flavor characteristics out of it. But... Uh, uh, and, and I yeah. think you're absolutely right, Chris. I mean, if you can get you, if you can find a beekeeper, find a find a, find a local source for some clover honey. I know a lot of people that make uh, hard ciders use clover honey uh, as well. Mm-hmm. I've, I've seen that in a, in a lot of recipes. Yeah, and you mentioned that that we didn't have a good selection down here. Uh, actually, we've got probably the two most sought after honeys in the world. Uh, in here in the south, one is Tupelo, and and the other is the sourwood, which by, was voted, I think, the last two years in a row by the World Honey Association, or uh, I don't know the correct name. It was voted the best honey in the world uh, wow. for two years in a row. Uh, I believe I'm correct on that. You, I know it was voted at least one year, and I think it was two, but. Um, so we do have those two honeys that are the most sought after in the world. Uh, the problem with our honey, as I've said before many times, uh, we're blessed with a really 
good, warm climate. Uh, and it's warm here, you know, uh, 325 days of the year. <laughs> yeah. So, Rub it uh, in. So, <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, it's great for, uh, it's great for going swimming, but it's not so great, uh, when you've got that many, you know, anything that can grow grows here. And so, Every flower bed around here has got marigolds, uh, which are the most bitter, vile thing you ever tasted. Uh, <laughs> Mississippi is the magnolia state. We've got magnolia blossoms everywhere. The most beautiful smelling flower you've ever smelled. Absolutely awful in honey. <laughs> So we've got lots of pasture land, so we've got a lot of milkweed. We've got a lot of bitterweed. Uh, we've got a lot of pasture thistle, which is very bitter. Uh, and, uh, by the way, pasture thistle is a whole other world from star thistle. Star thistle is excellent honey. Pasture thistle, not so much. So if you get local honey from here, you're getting this huge, bitter, sour bomb it, it's awful it's great it's it's great to put on your biscuits it's wonderful table honey you ferment that stuff down and it's just undrinkable oh wow uh and, and it always makes me jealous when I hear people talking from other parts of the country. They talk about, oh, we, we have the most wonderful local honey. Find your local beekeeper. And I tell everybody around here, avoid your local beekeeper <laughs> because <laughs> this is not what you want here. Uh, so, but it's just because of our climate. We, you know, so many things can grow here that just don't lend what I consider good qualities to honey for mead making. So, yeah. interesting. Uh, well, yeah. uh, we're we're going to make every attempt at keeping this show at a ninety minute max time. Like, that. hey, you know what? If we if we don't get done talking about it tonight, we'll talk about it next week. I wanted to bring Jeff in here to talk about this experiment that he's working on. You know, I mean, this whole nutrient thing, I'm still kind of getting used to it. I'm, I'm not convinced that the typical, you know, nutrient thing that I'm doing, uh, the, you know, the Fermate K thing with the DAP and all that, I, I don't know that that's really the direction I, I need to be going. I'm more inclined, and I know Chris and I have talked about this offline, about this Tozna thing. Chris, I know, is pretty convinced uh, you know about it, and uh, Jeff, tell tell us what you're doing. Well, you know, it, this started essentially from the same question. Um, I'd been using DAP and Fermate K for a long time, and I'd heard a lot of really, uh, really enthusiastic things about the toasting of the Fermate O. Um, so I, I kind of thought, well, is one necessarily eating better than the other? Um, and I, I kind of gathered some some opinions on. You know, ways to, uh, ways to handle the staggered nutrient additions and things like that. And let me preface this by saying, um, up until about a year ago, for the most part, my nutrient addition was just, uh, read the directions on the package and do that right, right. at the start of fermentation. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. I had, I had very little finesse involved with this. So, um, I, I I started staggering things out a little bit, and um, I got some good results that way. So I, I kind of thought, well, you know, I should really find one way that I want to do this and that gives me the best results possible. So what I should do is basically start like a single five-gallon batch and split that among some different possibilities. And so um, in terms of protocol and figuring out which ones I wanted to do. I found there was uh, the, the Meat Maker podcast, not to, to pitch another podcast here, um, has their batch builder program. Um, and that gives you, I believe, three different options, including like the Fermi K and the DAP and the Toast Nun. Um, it's a very easy to use tool. So I plugged that in. Um, the I, I plugged in the, uh, the the concentration of my batch as far as uh, 1120 um, significant gravity and 
uh, kind of went through all these different options and then uh, improvised a little bit from there to get another option that seemed to make more sense to me based on what I'd heard of Fermate O. Um, because if the, the the third option that I'm testing involves starting with Fermate O and then finishing at Fermate K and DAP. Well, the from what I understood about Fermate O is that it's it's more useful or more uh, available in the latter stages of fermentation. So it would make more sense to me to finish with it. Um, and so I did one that is essentially just taking that third option and flipping it backwards. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, I have a control that's just following the directions on the package. Right. Yeah. And where where are you at in in this whole process now? Well, um, I'm around about a week into this whole experiment. Um, and I actually, everything hit the one third sugar break yesterday evening. So I've made all the final, um, final additions to the, the meat and it's kind of just waiting for things to differentiate out and see how things go from here. And this, this, this is just a, a plain Jane run of the mill, traditional meat that you're, you're making, right? Oh yeah, no, it, it's as basic as you can get. I used, uh, about, I want to say 16, 17 pounds of big box honey and, uh, some D47 yeast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll tell you another interesting thing you might want to try. Uh, this is actually what I had done for quite a while when I heard about Tosna before I finally made the leap to using Permade O. I followed the Tosna protocol but I used only Permade K uh, and the only modification you have to make is in your calculations rather than using uh, 50 parts per million for the Permade O uh, use 100 parts per million for your Permade K and that makes sense how <laughs> put that well put that back you out of English class what, what does that mean <laughs> go to go to go to Sergio's website which is meat made right are you kidding me that, that's still Greek to me <laughs> well, essentially I'm an old country the, boy from Colorado what the hell do I know I, about I'll let the, million Man, if you if if a chicken farmer like me in Mississippi can do it, I know you can. You damn Yankees up in Colorado, and uh, I'll let Jeff explain it to you. He's well, essentially, from what I've been given to understand, the the uh, the yeast available nitrogen in the Fermate K is just at a higher concentration than the Fermate O, um, so you get more. You get more uh, depth, more right? of that nitrogen in the same amount of volume um, compared to Fermate O. You're talking about yeah. DAP, yeah, not yeast, DAP, right? No, uh, Fermate K. Yeah. 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 You got it? Yeah, I got, well, I got it, but I, th- I thought it was... <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe I heard it heard it wrong, but he, I thought he said something about the the yeast and the Fermate K. But I, I thought you meant DAP. Uh, this in the well, oh, the Fermate K has a small amount of DAP in it. Yeah, yeah, that I knew. Yeah, yeah. Um, I you know basically like if you want to get let's say if you want to get three hundred parts per million, uh, if you were using Fermate O, you would divide by fifty, so you would have six grams per gallon or whatever. Okay, so if you're doing from K, you would divide by 100 instead of 50, so you'd have three grams per gallon. So That's that's my science teacher talking there, so he and I are going to get together sometime and talk about this. <laughs> um, and Chris, and yeah. Chris, Chris is one of the few people that I know of that, I, that can actually taste the dap. Uh, I have no idea what it even tastes like, uh, so I don't even know what to, what to even look for. Can you? Can you? It's a chemical taste. Yeah, it's a chemical taste, and uh, by all theories, on paper, I shouldn't be able to taste it because if you use it in the correct amounts, it should be consumed by the yeast, and you shouldn't taste it. I can taste it. Um, 
And I know that Michael Fairbrother at Moonlight Meter can taste it as well. He and I have had this conversation before. Um, so at least I know I'm not the only one. We may be the only two people in the world that can taste it, but, um, it's, it's offensive and it's, it's a chemical flavor. Uh, that's why I started getting away from it. Yeah. And, and I'm not a hundred percent convinced yet that the use of doubt in excess, I think contributes to hot alcohol formation. I can't prove that. Uh, but I do know from my experience that when I was using the standard DAP from AK regimen, um, I was getting hot alcohol left and right. Since I got away from it, I'm drinking mead out of primary bucket. <laughs> so, uh, and enjoying it. Not flip to say it's not going to get better. It's going to get better. Lid. Yeah, flip off lid, insert straw. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and that was my experience, too, with, with this experiment that I've been working on. In the past, the nutrients that I've been using, I can't even tell you what they are. It's whatever the local homebrew supply shop sells with their mead kits. And, you know, one is your generic yeast nutrient and the other is the energizer. And, and I'm convinced it's the same thing you're talking about, Chris. It, it just puts off these fusel alcohols and, and hot hot flavors to it and I just couldn't get over how smooth and clean these batches came out with the Fermato. Mm-hmm. And and it should be understood that that they will get better, regardless of how good they are now. Uh any mead's gonna get better with some age. Uh but why put yourself through the weight when you can enjoy it perfectly well when it's, you know, a couple months old. <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely. Do you think the ceiling's any higher too? So you know, one of these that that produces a little more of those fusel alcohols is is the ceiling only so high with that, and it's only going to get so good after X number of years of aging, and these other ones just have a higher ceiling. Do you think? I wish I could tell you that because um, mine doesn't. It never lasts long enough. <laughs> doesn't last. Uh, I can see that would be I've, the case. I've got, yeah, I've got a lot of alcoholic friends, <laughs> and <laughs> and they don't really care. Uh, so as soon as I turn it out and get it bottled, it's gone. And uh, so I, I, the oldest me that I have right now is about. 14 months old and the only reason that I have it is because I hit it <laughs> and uh, there you go and it's still awesome. in the carboy it's never been bottled if it, if it was bottled it'd be gone <laughs> wow we're talking and I'm not bragging uh, I don't want you to think I'm bragging and saying I make such great mead that everybody no 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 it's not that it's just that I have alcoholic friends who, well what what do you tie once you tie one on, anything you put in your mouth is kind of over and done with anyway, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <Sorry. I'm> okay. <laughs> We're talking to Aaron Martin uh, with us here tonight, Mississippi Chris from, obviously, Mississippi, Jeff Shrouse from Kansas City, Missouri. This is the Mead House. You can still call us, 818-921-4680. You can call us anytime during the show. We don't care. This is a very non-formal you know, if you're looking to if you're looking to open a meadery, this is not the show you want to listen to. But if you're looking to make good mead before you open that meadery, this is the show that you need to be listening to. I mean, this is a show where we share uh, different experiences. We talk about uh, you know, like we're doing tonight. I mean, this whole nutrient thing, Tosna. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, it just runs the gamut, and yeah, it's just I mean, it just it's just good sitting around a table talking uh, me tonight here. Um, one of the things, uh, I got a friend who, who uh, is a mead maker in Colorado. His name is Jim Davis. And uh, when I was doing the other show, he he caught on to my, my Rube Goldberg, which we'll get more into in upcoming shows. In fact, we'll just kind of have maybe a Maybe a couple times a month, do like a Rube Goldberg minute. Uh, 
and uh, he sent me an email here a few days back, or a week ago or so, and he's talking about wanting to put together a pump over uh, system to uh, degas and stir his mead. And I thought, what the hell is he talking about? And then he sent me a video, and uh, I believe the one he sent me was actually from Melovino Meadery from Sergio Motella's place out there in New Jersey. And what they do is they use a pump, and they simply pump it from the bottom of the fermenter to the top of the fermenter. And it creates this this uh, wash in the you know inside the fermenter that you know actually does uh, you can kill two birds with one stone. I mean you can degas and you can stir uh, all at the same time and punch the cap down. Yeah. Uh, so if you're he, using fruit. Yeah, exactly. So he, he he's talking about wanting to build. Or, or at least look into, uh, you know, putting something like this together. And I'm a big DIY fan, uh, big time. Uh, you know, because I, I, you, you go out there and, and you price some of the equipment out there that, you know, you can build for 10 bucks. Uh, you can either buy it for 200 or build it for 10 bucks. I mean, what would you do? So the only thing that concerns me, uh, and I don't know what you, you know, I mean, have you guys uh, ever heard of a pump over system you ever seen something like that before it's used in commercial production yeah uh more so and and you know i gotta ask uh what size matches is he making because i i I mean i love all kinds of gadgets and i'm certainly not opposed to it but uh i gotta ask how how feasible would it be you know when you got a five or six or ten gallon batch. You with a lee stir and a drill, you can pretty much do the job in five minutes. Yeah, uh, uh, I think I, I don't think he's doing much more than five gallons. Uh, he didn't specify, but uh, I don't think I think he's doing something around five gallons, five to six gallons. So, man, and that, and that was my concern. I mean, my 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 first thought is that any I mean even even these wine pumps that you buy, they've got some pretty good velocity to them, and I mean I you know to to rig it up to the top of your fermenter I mean I I would just be afraid of this thing spewing out must like a fire hose you know what I mean. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the, uh, it would probably serve to degas and maybe even aerate to some degree. But I think in the in the commercial application, I think it's mostly used in punching down the fruit cap. Um, I think well, that's, yeah, uh, yeah, and the, and the one that uh, the, the one he did send a video that I did see. I'm sure it was uh, from Melovino Meadery. Uh, I mean, it looks like they're actually using it just, you know, to stir the must. Of course, you only want to do that in the beginning. Uh, you, you certainly don't want to do that afterwards because you don't want to introduce any oxygen, uh, you know, once you're past, uh, you know, about, what, the one-third break. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe 50% yeah. at the most. Yeah, so a- after a certain point, it would seem to me like it would almost become useless to – have something like that. However, and what was his name? Jim Davis. Jim Davis. Well, Jim, uh, I I don't see the use particularly in a small batch, but if you want to design for it, we'll come up with one for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, he he sent me he sent me some links to some wine pumps. Um, he's talking about using a diaphragm pump. Uh, which was another concern. I mean, you, you would have to use something, you know, food grade type pump. You can't use anything with exposed bearings or anything like that. Um, but it would be a fun. Uh, it, it sounds like a fun uh, project to play around with. I, you know, I may get involved with this. But uh, there is a second. Uh, there's a second use for it uh, also. And that's to use it as a transfer system as well. Uh, I have a vacuum system that I use, and uh, it works like a champ. Uh, you know, I just I can't be more thrilled 
and it's you know pretty much a I might have maybe thirty dollars invested in this whole thing, uh, and I can transfer five gallons one gallon it, it doesn't matter the size uh, and we'll put that up on the uh, on the on the meat house website as well the plans for it and I'll, you know the and that's what you use you use that to rack your meads too don't you yep yep I use that to rack my meads uh, I have arthritis pretty bad in both hands and I've broken every freaking glass in the house. Uh, so it's difficult for me to pick these damn heavy carboys up because I'm afraid I'm just going to drop them. So I had to come up with something. And uh, I saw a couple examples on YouTube, and I thought, hmm. Uh, so I just gathered up all the parts, the hardware store, Amazon.com, and built this uh, vacuum system racking pump, uh, and uh, it works like a champ. I mean, uh, it makes use of my racking. I just stick the racking cane down in your must just like you would anyway, except, it, it you know, the other end goes into the uh, empty carboy, and then the capper that goes on to the empty carboy is sealed. It has another uh, hole in it for the vacuum tube, and you just simply create the vacuum inside the glass carboy and it will suck the must up from your fermenter uh, right into your uh, right into your carboy. So I don't have to pick anything up. Uh, it's tabletop compatible, uh, and it works like a champ. So uh, yeah, and versatile too, because I'm sure with a little ingenuity you can you can figure out a way to to reverse that and use it maybe to vacuum the gas as well. Yeah. Actually, actually, I already I, I am doing that, uh, and all it takes is a bung, uh, uh, just a regular bung, and uh, a valve. I have a I put a valve on mine, and you just simply hook the hose up, uh, the tubing up from the suction line to the top of the bung. Uh, now you might have to play around with some fittings and and sizes and everything to get the correct fit. It doesn't take much, I can tell you that. Uh, and uh, just simply put the bung on top of the carboy and turn your pump on. Mm-hmm. You have what to. Cool I was setup. using a, I was using a food saver to uh, to vacuum the gas, and uh, I was having a lot of trouble getting a good seal. But uh, finally got that figured out, and uh, trying to use an oversized tube to go in the bung, and. You know, you can't get it in there. I tried hot water. and everything. Finally, I did, you know, what I, in my twisted way of thinking, uh, I did what seemed like the right thing. I got some Astroglide and put on it. <laughs> you know, awesome. I mean, we're, we're putting something in the bone, so yeah. let's get some Astroglide. And sealed it right off and vacuum degassed it and yeah. worked like a charm. But then... <laughs> If you start getting any kind of foam, then you clog up your food saver. Well, so, okay. okay. So what you need to do is put a blow-off jar in between, uh, yeah. and it, it's simply uh, another part that I got from Amazon.com. It's a whole house filter, water filter canister. And mm-hmm. you get it. It has. Uh, you can get a quarter inch. You can get a three eighths. I got three eighths uh, fittings on it. You put three eighths barbs on, on the intake and the outtake, and you put that between your vacuum line. So that if you do suck any it's liquid, just in line. right, it'll go into the canister before it goes into the pump. All right. So, uh, See, we we can figure stuff out, on, you know. Absolutely. Like I said, I, I'm a huge fan of Rube Goldberg. I mean, I have duct tape and bailing wired stuff on the farm together. I mean, I've held John Deere tractors together with nothing more than bailing wire uh, and mm-hmm. driven them down the road to the mechanic to get it fixed. You know what I mean? So Yeah, well, duct tape is like the force, man. It it has a light <laughs> side and a dark side, and it holds the universe together. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah. 
Jeff, have you ever uh, had, did you use anything like that, or ever ever think of doing something like that at all? Well, you know the that vacuum tube um, does sound really interesting. I would love to see plans for that. Um, not really a lot of uh, Rube Goldberging yet. Um, I'm, I'm kind of in the process of converting an old refrigerator into a. Uh, um, a temperature control, but that's about the the extent of my Rube Goldberg so far. Yeah, oh, cool. that's hey. going to be the best move you ever made. Trust me. Yeah, Chris. Chris has got one uh, that he's converted. Yeah, I actually found a little dorm room refrigerator uh, that uh, my bucket fits in perfectly. Uh, yeah, that's that's going to be the best move you ever made. How many times, JD, have I said uh, I didn't start making good mead until I got control of my fermentation temperatures? Yeah, yeah, I, it you made know, all the difference. That's probably worthy of another show too. I mean, this whole thing, and you know, I mean, I, I don't know how how. You know, uh, Jeff and Aaron started. I mean, I, I just, you know, we talked about it earlier. How many, how many gallons upon gallons of mead did I uh, fed to the garbage disposal and tried to pass off to my neighbors until they thought I was trying to poison them? But uh, you know, I, I mean, until you, you know, and here again, I mean, the mistake. I mean. Uh, Jeff, I mean, let me ask you: When you first started making mead, were you like me? Did you go out? You found all these recipes on all these websites, and and uh, you know, go out buy the yeast, the honey, and and throw it together and hope for the best. A little bit, yeah. I, to be honest, I didn't do a lot of research on the web. I found uh, I found Ken Schramm's book, and I found a recipe at my local homebrew store. Oh. Um, and after talking to to another mead maker that I met at a Renaissance fair a couple years beforehand, I, I kind of had this full notion that making mead was easy. <laughs> so uh, it is. Um, it, yeah, it can be. It it can be as complicated as you want to make it. I think at this point. <laughs> Yeah, it's easy. It's just uh, expensive. You have to story. <laughs> when uh, I, you know, I mean, I, I was I was kind of stupid because I thought I thought Google was like the answer to everything. So I went out to Google and I asked Google, "Hey, show me some mead recipes. Teach me about mead." Well, mm-hmm. it spit out these recipes that you know, like I said in the beginning. You know, people people post this stuff up. Uh, you know, uh, three pounds of wildflower honey. Uh, uh, you know, a gallon of water and some. You know, eleven eighteen yeast, and you just throw it all in the thing and shake the shit out of it. I'm sorry, shake the crap out out of it. Hey, hey you know what? FCC doesn't live here. Um, you shake, you shake, you shake the garbage out of it, okay, and aerate it, and then you put a airlock on it and and go away for a month. And that's how I started. You know, I mean, they say yeah. nothing about temperature control, nothing about nutrients, none of that kind of stuff. You know, mm. yeah, that's the and so uh, any new listeners, uh, let's just uh, let's make this very clear. This is sort of our introduction show. This is yeah. <laughs> where we just kind of, we're, we're going to get into some very detailed things in the weeks yeah. to come. Uh, we're going to get into some instructional type conversations. And uh, so this is, this is our introduction show. And uh, so we're, we're talking about a lot of different things here. I know, but rest assured, we're going to be getting some recipes up. We're going to be discussing all these things in detail that, you know, these beginning techniques, basic techniques, and then some advanced techniques as well. So, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So and, stay tuned. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I mean, this is the first one that, that's going to go in the can, and I, I got to. I got to say, though, I, I messed up the beginning of the show. <laughs> what's what's going in the can? We actually pick up Chris when, when we introduce Chris and Chris starts talking. 
the battery in my mouth. And, this, and I skipped over the whole what are we drinking thing, Aaron. Uh, oh, no. Oh, yeah. I mean, all of that. I, you know what I was doing? I was frantically trying to put freaking batteries in my mouth. And I couldn't. When I went to click on the encoder, the recording encoder to start recording the show, nothing happened. Oh, you're so kidding. I'm, no, so I'm sitting here talking. And I'm, I'm trying to put batteries in the mouse. And uh, anyway, so I got the batteries in. We got the show recorded. We pick up Chris uh, after the introduction. So we skip right over the uh, the whole pa- half of the freaking introduction. But anyway, so, but hey, you know what? Uh, that's, that's, that, that's the, uh, this is free radio, you know? Nobody's paying us mm-hmm. to do this. Uh, so if they're not happy, they can get their money back. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, but Just, I promise we will do better. You know, we'll, we'll certainly do better. And, you know, this is commercial free. There's no advertising here. Uh, like I said, simply this is just uh, three, possibly four, if I can convince Jeff uh, to come on uh, with us. Uh, just sitting around the table talking mead and various degrees of experience, uh, which I think pays off big time because we all learn from each other. Uh, you know, yeah, I, and Jeff mentioned something about uh, a moment ago. He mentioned uh, the Mead Makers podcast. Uh, and let me let me just say this. We're not in competition with anybody. Uh, The meat industry, although it's been around for thousands and thousands of years, uh, it's just now reemerging, and it's on a teeter-totter right now. And it can either take off like a rocket or it can crash and burn. And the quickest way to make it crash and burn is for us to be uh, secretive with our knowledge or you know the the way that we make this thing take off uh we the home brewers we are the heart of of this of meat making right now uh it's the home brewers that are bringing it back and then the really good home brewers are moving on to the commercial side and they're really pushing to bring it back if we stick together we help each other out um that's what this is all about. You know, it was the uh, search for knowledge that brought us all together, but it was the friendship that kept us here. So, uh, yeah. share your knowledge. Be free with it. We're not in competition. I listen to the meat makers, and, uh, you know, they they have some good stuff on. I listen to everybody. If there's a dozen podcasts on about meat making, I'll be listening to them. So, uh Let's all come together and and let's share our knowledge and help each other out and make better mead. Yeah, absolutely. Well, couldn't agree more. I like you know, it. I, the way I would say it is, I, I'm just a fan of the other shows out there, and, and the more the merrier. So, the more the more people out there talking mead, the better for for the movement. Well, oh, yeah, and everybody's show is recorded, so. Pick one to listen to live or, you know, listen, download the rest or download them all. I mean, shoot, there's no common. This is, you know, we're not catering to a million listeners here. Uh, it's not the Academy Awards. No. Uh, <laughs> and we're all here to, to help each other. So, yeah, the more the merrier. Somebody, uh, somebody once told me here a while back that you know they said podcasts were dead. That uh, uh, you know uh, they served its purpose and and they're really kind of pointless until you go to iTunes and go to their podcast library and there's literally thousands and thousands of podcasts on any given subject except making mead. Uh, there's mm-hmm. only a couple of them out there. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to be able to be involved with two of them so far. This is the second one. And, uh, you know, like you say, Chris, I mean, it, this is an emerging industry. There is relatively little data out there uh, that you can point a finger to and say, yeah, this is what we need to be doing. Hell, everything they know about me, they got from from – making wine. I mean, we're still using yeast that are specifically made to to uh, ferment wine, ferment grapes. And we're doing our best to try to come up with 
you know, what works good with what honeys and what works good with what styles of mead as far as yeast goes using the wine yeast. So until they get to and it's the home brewers that are doing that, it's people exactly. like Jeff and Aaron yep. and you and myself. We're the ones that are uh, we're, we're the ones pouring the failed batches down the drain and saying, you know, mark that one off the list. That don't work. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and so. Uh, so Jeff, what, uh, what do you think, bud? Uh, can you uh, you think you'd like to be a part of this show on a regular basis, or uh, a few? Um, well, let me talk it over with the wife. I, I think I would enjoy that. But, you know, got to make sure the schedule lines up correctly here. Yeah, I got you know everything I do. I got to check in with the boss too. So. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> so mine has total control over me right now because I'm in a chair. So uh. yeah. <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't have too many bargaining chips right now, do you, Chris? I have no bargaining chips right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I sent Chris a text the other day, and what I got back sat me right up in my chair, and I'm and I'm thinking, holy crap. Uh, I didn't know whether to call. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, it had just happened, and uh, you know, come to find out that Chris was involved in this terrible auto accident out there in Mississippi, and wow, uh, really kind of set me back a little bit there. But uh, Chris is doing all right. Um, yeah. I will. You can't keep a redneck down, no matter how hard you try. <laughs> so. We uh, we find a way. Well, you know, Jeff, I'm anxious to hear more about your uh, your experience, uh, your experiment. Uh, you know, it's these kinds of things uh, that you and Aaron are doing to you know help write the white paper or the data sheets out there that you know kind of the been there done that thing. Here's the result. Uh, and, uh, you know, that gets down, uh, gets recorded somewhere, whether it's passed off on a Facebook page or a, or on somebody's website or, or, or someplace. Uh, you know, at least it's knowledge for other people out there to learn from, to use, uh, you know, to say, hey, you know, don't try that. This guy tried it, and this is the result. So, uh, and that's kind of where it's at for us, you know. Yeah, yeah it really is the, the home league makers that are the innovators in this field, and that's Part of what makes it just an exciting hobby. Yeah. Well, you and know, we need to hear about Aaron's other two meads too. You you talked about the cranberry yeah. and the uh, sunflower. We need to hear about your other two as well. Uh, another point to make, real quick, uh, on Aaron's uh, little experiment there. Uh, if you want to learn how to to compare these honeys and see what kind of mead they're going to make, uh, always keep some of the honey with your batch of mead. And once that mead has settled out and cleared and, and you can get a, a, a realistic taste of what it's going to be like, uh, then go back and taste your honey along with it and and see if you can connect those flavors. That is a great suggestion. Do a side by side taste comparison. And I saved a little small amount of each of the honeys with the intention that, you know, if they fermented too bone dry, that I could back sweeten a little bit. But I, I think I'm, I'm going to withhold on doing that and, and plan on doing that honey flavor comparison to the finished mead. You just gave yeah. new, you just gave new purpose to a crap load of little jelly jars I've got in the closet. <laughs> uh, you know, you know, Aaron, we 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 need to start we need to start a page on on the website, I guess, for our notes. Uh, these kinds of things, uh, things that we learn talking to each other on the show. Uh, you know, that's a hell of a good idea. And why I didn't think of that uh, before is beyond me, but that makes total sense to me. If I'd have had, if I'd have had, if, I wished I had some of that orange blossom honey that I used when I put that first batch, the first big batch of mine together. I wish I had some of that to, to taste right now as I'm drinking my, my mead. Uh, 
you know, might have made a whole lot more sense as to what I was tasting and smelling and and that kind of thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's able. a great thing. It's a great, great way to compare. And uh, uh, if you do that enough, you will eventually get to the point where you you, you can say, okay, I, I see now where this flavor is coming from. Uh, yeah. You know, when you strip away that sweetness, what you're left with is the backbone of the honey. And, you know, you can start to recognize it. And it's uh, finding the correct words to describe it is sometimes difficult for me. Uh, I know what I'm tasting. I just don't know how to describe it. And yeah, uh, that comes from it. Yeah, and that comes from, uh, uh, I'm getting a lot of help from that uh, by reading tasting notes from professional tasters and from, uh, you know, people who are professional BJCP judges and things like that in competitions. If you read their tasting notes, um, you you start to pick up this vocabulary, and and then when you smell it or when you taste it, you go, okay, now I see see what they where that's coming from. You see, I never associated uh, a tart apple flavor with honey until I, I read some tasting notes on sourwood. I went and got some of my sourwood honey, and I tasted it, and, and it was right in front of my face. You know, it was like, that's it. It's apple. That's what I'm tasting. Mm-hmm. And uh, so sometimes it just, it just takes a, a little imagination and, and reading, and 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 all of a sudden it just jumps out at you. So, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I think uh, I think we're at zero hour, aren't we? Gosh, uh, my how went time- by fast. <laughs> yeah, it did. Uh, am I looking at the clock right? Is it like ten uh, thirty Eastern? Looks like that's about it. I got some hydrocodone calling my name. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, Chris managed to stick it out for the full ninety minutes. Uh, wow, Chris! Uh, yeah, tipping the cap to you, sir. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, okay. And uh, I'm pleased to pop up to you now. Big thanks to uh, Jeff Strauss for you know joining us here tonight, and uh, we're going to see if we can't get Jeff on as a regular here. Uh, to join the party, uh, the Mead Maker, the Mead Maker, the uh, the Mead House show every Tuesday night at nine o'clock right here on the dot com. That's where you can listen to it. And again, uh, we're going to have in the next couple of weeks, we're going to have our own very own Mead House apps that will launch the uh, the show. You can take as uh, mobile if you'd like. We have no Facebook. No Twitter, just a website. And that's how it's going to roll here at themeadhouse.com. So with that, we're going to return you back to your regular scheduled programming. Enjoy the music. In the meantime, we'll probably do just a little bit of an after party here as we put Chris to bed. So uh, we'll see you next week. (laughs) So long. Have a good one. 